I think I am older than frozen pizza. Anybody else here older than frozen pizza? But how many of you remember Mama Celeste? The real Mama Celeste, she used to show up in her commercials. And what did she say about her pizza? It was what? Abondanza. Let me hear you say abondanza. abondanza. Now I want you to say like her Italian, abondanza. abondanza. Got to do the hands, folks. When I did sign language and I would suddenly start signing if I had something in my mouth, people said to me all the time, are you Italian? Anybody here of Italian descent? Do we have any Italians here? Catherine, did your family talk with their hands? And abondanza is a great word. What does it mean? It means abundance, but it means more than that. It means abundance, plenty. It's more of a declaration of how wonderful life is. So you get life and you get it. Abondanza. Let me hear your abondanza. abondanza. Pretend you're Italian. Catherine, show them how it's done. Abondanza. Very good. Abondanza. We're talking about abundance here, aren't we? An abundance of grace, an abundance of mercy, an abundance of peace. Jesus is saying these words, and this is what we call the Sermon on the Plain, the Sermon on the Level Ground. It's very much like Matthew's account, which is the Sermon on the Mount, but this time everybody's like eye to eye, face to face, toe to toe, listening to the Word of God, which applies evenly to everyone. And Jesus is saying words that are familiar to us, more from the Sermon on the Mount usually, because I think you all know Matthew a little bit better than you know Luke when it comes to this particular teaching. But I want us to look at it this morning as we look at stewardship. I want us to think about what it means. Now, Jesus is talking about lending and borrowing and things like that. Now, the Roman Empire allowed for their taxation to be about 50% or their interest rates on money that they would lend, 50%. That's a lot of interest. And in the Old Testament, usury is what the charging of money, lending of money in order to receive interest payments was called and God frowned upon that. So there were some sort of caveats to the law in that time that you could borrow money with interest from another Jewish person, but what happens every seven years in the Old Testament, the year of what? Jubilee, the forgiveness of debts. So some people were borrowing in the sixth year before the Jubilee and not paying it back. So Jesus is saying here, you have to be careful about how you do your weights, how you do your measures, how you do you're borrowing and you're lending. Because people needed to borrow money in those days. They didn't have a lot. And Jesus is saying to them, if you do what sinners do, what good is it? If you love somebody who loves you back, is that any, any credit to you? Because I tell you what, the worst criminal in the world usually when they see their newborn child is overwhelmed with love. They fall in love like the rest of us. So if you do that, what good is that for you? And if you only lend to people that you're going to receive back from, he said anybody does that. The loan sharks do that. And it's sad to say that the loan sharks in Baltimore sometimes charge less interest than some legal places that lend money. That's why people go there, and then things turn bad. Jesus is saying, if you want to really understand who I am and what this is about, this abundant life that I'm offering, you need to go above and beyond, and your reward will be great. He'll be children of the Most High. He's kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. And then he says, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Don't judge, you won't be judged. Don't condemn, you won't be condemned. Forgive, you'll be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Now, that would be a great stewardship sermon just there, right? Give, and you'll receive. That's what you hear sometimes from televangelists. There's one in particular, and he will say, Somebody sent me $14 last week, and they wrote me a letter this week. They won $14,000 in the lottery. It's right out of the Bible. There was a man in one of my congregations who was an elderly man who was deaf. He believed him and he sent him a check for a lot of money, all that he had in his bank. Completely cleaned out his bank account. He had to move out of the nice apartment building he lived in and moved into really a slum because he had sent all his money away. He said, I don't understand why would God do this to me? But God didn't do it to you, an unscrupulous pastor. It's also not about the prosperity gospel. And I don't like stewardship sermons that say, if you give, you'll be blessed. God wants you to be rich. Do you think God wants you to be rich? I don't think God wants you to be poor. And I think God wants you to take the resources you have and do the right thing with them, which is not necessarily writing a check to the church. I'm not, that's not the kind of stewardship sermon I'm preaching up here this morning. I want you to know that right now. But it's about making what we have available to God. 
for God's sake, not for what we're going to get back, not for what we might hope to receive in its place. So I'm never going to tell you to give because you've been, give because you will be blessed. I will tell you you have been blessed and therefore you give of yourself. And as this passage talks very little about money, it's really talking about other things. It's talking about grace and mercy. It's talking about not judging and not condemning others. And that's what we're going to get back in abundance. It's also not karma. Do you know what karma is? Karma is part of some Eastern religious tradition where what you give is what you get. Now, years ago, a woman in my congregation said, there's a couple that I work with. They're getting married, and they would like to get back into the church. They haven't been in the church since they were children, and they want to get back into the church. Would you talk to them about doing their wedding? I said, sure, I will. And they decided they wanted to get married outside and said, would you still do it outside? And I said, wherever I go, it's a church wedding because I'm a representative of Jesus Christ. So whether you're married in the cathedral on the hill or the cathedral out under the trees, if I'm there, it's a Christian wedding. What I did to them, I say to every bride and groom that I've ever married, I say, I need you to pick your own scripture because there will be scripture, there will be a sermon. And they're like, a sermon? I said, not hellfire and brimstone, but it'll give you a chance to focus on what you're doing because a wedding is a service of worship with the same structure. You praise God, you proclaim God's word, and then you respond to God's word. And in a wedding, that is the bride and groom committing their lives to one another. So I told them, you know, go to BibleGateway.com. You can search any word you want. You can find it in scripture in any version that is in print. And they came back and they handed me the lesson. They said, this is what we picked to read at our wedding. I read it and I said, this is beautiful, but this is not from the Bible. They said, well, we didn't like anything from the Bible. We looked at it all. I was amazed by that. It was a reading from karma. I said, well, I need scripture to preach from. And they said, but this is what we believe. The good you do comes back to you. And the bad you do comes back to you. And I said, Jesus did nothing but good his entire life, his entire ministry. He did nothing but build up the world. He did nothing but proclaim God's love and grace, and they nailed him to a cross. I wish we could say that what we give is what we get in that respect, but that is not true. So they came back the next week with their passage, and I read, love is faithful, love is kind, love is gentle, love is not boastful. It's not about giving in order to receive. It's not giving so that we get back good. But God has given us so much in abundance. Can I hear that? Abondanza. Who here has received grace? Let me hear it. Abondanza. Who has received mercy? Abondanza. That's our new amen around here, right? Abondanza. I've received it in abundance. I have received more than I've ever thought of giving God. I've received so much for the very little I've given God. I have received. Now, some of you, I know Mark knows Peggy Johnson, and some of you have met Peggy Johnson, who just retired as a bishop of the United Methodist Church. I knew her when she was just Peggy, my pal, and she was my bridesmaid, so I had the most famous of wedding parties in history. I had a bishop as a bridesmaid. Mm -hmm. And Peggy was elected in 2008. And Peggy is an unassuming person, born with one eye, little tiny thing, never served as a superintendent, served in deaf ministry most of her career. And there were people who said she doesn't stand a snowball's chance in a hot place of being elected bishop. Bishop we had at the time was one of those naysayers. He said to me, she's not going to be elected. I said, watch it happen, buddy. Because the Holy Spirit had revealed to me and to Peggy's husband, Michael, that she was going to be a bishop, and I trust the Holy Spirit. Well, one of the things that happens when you put your name in the hat to be a bishop, you have to be evaluated, you have to be vetted, you have to be questioned, and some groups might come forward and endorse you, and our annual conference endorsed Peggy. And she got to jurisdictional conference, and here's your United Methodist lesson of the day. Jurisdictional conference elects our bishops from pastors in the Northeast jurisdiction, ordained elders are eligible to be elected as a bishop. And Matt Poole, who was a member of our conference, who was a jurisdictional delegate, called me sobbing like a baby because he said he was there when Peggy was elected as a bishop. He said what did it for the people was they all came out one at a time to be interviewed in front of the entire jurisdictional conference. Our jurisdiction goes from Maine to West Virginia. There are three or four conferences in Pennsylvania. I've lost track of where all the conferences are because they change the boundaries from time to time. Peninsula, Delaware, Susquehanna, Eastern Pennsylvania, Western Pennsylvania, New England, that whole area, and all the New York conferences are part of this jurisdiction. 
they asked them all the same question. What do you want to be remembered for? And that's how they sat there through the people who said, I want to be remembered for the sermons I preached that led people to Christ. I want to be remembered for leading people to Christ. I want to be remembered for my accomplishments, da 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 He said Peggy was the last to come out on the stage. They didn't hear the other answers, and they said to her, what would you like to be remembered for? And Peggy always goes, hmm. And he said she did the hmm. She said, I want to be remembered for giving away everything God ever gave me. And Matt said, I burst out sobbing, and with me the whole jurisdictional conference did, because he said it was like the light of heaven opened up on her. Because she wants to be remembered not for what she had, but what she gave away. Everything God gave her, she wants to give to someone else. She lived that way. We have a deaf-blind camp in the United Methodist Church in the Baltimore-Washington Conference. It started because before Peggy went into the ministry, she was a music teacher in the public school system. And because she had a degree in music, she was asked by a major book publisher to edit a book, a textbook for music. She edited the textbook. They gave her a check for $10,000. She didn't even cash it. She endorsed it and handed it to the conference treasurer, and that is how Deaf Blind Camp started. This isn't about money, though. It's about what we have been entrusted with. We've been entrusted with grace and mercy. We have been entrusted with the ability not to judge others, and it's hard. It's hard. It's hard sometimes not to be judgmental, not to be condemn, condemning of others. It's hard not to let anger get the best of us because we all have not been treated the best in life, have we? Everyone here has a sad story to tell me about someone who done you wrong. I know that to be the case. We've been hurt. We've been cheated. We've been abused in our lives. But we've also been shown grace in abundance life in abundance, forgiveness in abundance, abundanza. It's not just about having enough, it's about having more than we could ever hope for or need or want or desire. We have been given all those things in Jesus Christ. We just have to learn how to give them to others. Now, there was a time when I did a really bizarre pastoral call, got on a plane and flew to Omaha, Nebraska, because God bless them, parents in my congregation had a daughter who was a high school senior. Her boyfriend was a recent high school graduate. He graduated the year before her, and he joined the Air Force and was stationed in Omaha. He was very unhappy there, and she was begging her parents to go see him, and they said to her, why don't you ask Pastor Terry? It was before I was married. This was a long time ago. She doesn't have a husband. Maybe she'll take you. Can you imagine what a 17-year-old girl will go through to get somebody to fly her to Nebraska? I pick up my phone when it rang at 5.30 in the morning. She's going, please, please, please. Well, I flew to Nebraska, which was a good thing because this was a hurting boy. And I said to him, have you been to church? He said, I don't think there's a Methodist church here. I said, it's North America, darling. There are 17 probably within walking distance. And sure enough, there was one that he could walk to that of all the strange coincidences in the world, this is a God thing, had been designed by the same architect who designed Trinity Church in Frederick, Maryland. It was an exact replica of the sanctuary he had grown up in. He walked in and he said, I feel like I'm at home. The pastor that morning said to me, are you new in the community? I said, no, I'm your colleague from the Baltimore Washington Conference. This one is mine and I'm giving him to you. And he ended up being their youth leader. But we had gone out to dinner, the three of us. And we had a waitress from hell. This woman hated and despised us. I don't know why. She just was mean and nasty and rude and horrible. The third time I asked for a cup of coffee, she put the cup down and poured it until it overflowed and ran off the table and onto my lap and looked at me like, here's your coffee, hon. And they said to me, these young people watching this, they said, she's so rude, she's so horrible, she's awful, she's this, she's that, she's the other. They said, you're not going to leave her a tip, are you? And if they hadn't said that to me, I probably would have walked out without a tip. I probably said, I'd like to see the manager, please. But they said, you're not going to leave her a tip, are you? And I thought, how can I not leave her a tip? I work for Jesus. How can I not use this moment to do something? And I taught myself a lesson. This was a teachable moment to Pastor Terry, not to the children that I was with. I left her a tip equal to the cost of the meal. And I wrote her a note to go with it, and I said, I don't know who did this to ruin your day, but it wasn't us. You took it out on us, and that wasn't right. I hope this makes it up to the point that you can treat the next person with more respect. 
They said, you're not really going to leave that, are you? And I said, yep. And I left it for her, and I went out and got in my little rental car. And they went back, and they said, we want to see her get it. We want to see her. And they said they watched her open the note and read it, and she sat at the table and burst out sobbing with her head in her hand. I said to them, you don't know, maybe her mother died yesterday. Maybe she's being evicted from her home. We don't know what tragedy she had, but we have a chance to return good for not so good. It's not always easy to do that, though. It helps when you're a pastor and you got two of your parishioners watching you, and they're young and impressionable. But we need to learn to be giving in all ways, to say, God, what you've given me is yours. And that does involve our financial stewardship, because we rely on you to be able to do ministry together in the name of Jesus Christ. That's just how it comes down. But it's got to be about more than money, folks. It's got to be about how we embody the kingdom of God, because that's what we're talking about here, embodying the kingdom of God. Otherwise, Jesus is a nice moral philosopher, isn't he? I said that to sometimes to people who think they're atheists. I said, well, you know, look at Jesus as a moral philosopher. Look at him for an ethical way to live in the world. Some people have come to Christ through that door. But it's got to be more than that. It's got to be more than saying this is just a nice way to live amongst other people so that we get along better. This has to be who we are as citizens of the kingdom of God who stand there pointing people to their Savior. And that's by sharing what God has given us, abundanza, grace, forgiveness, mercy. Mercy. You know what mercy is? It's showing compassion to somebody who doesn't deserve it in the least. That's what mercy is. So if you have been blessed abundantly, let somebody know it. Now, Mama Celeste's pizza was not all that good. You know, the commercials were great, and I thought this was going to be great. It was a little frozen pizza with little frozen hard things on it. But I have been given grace, abundanza. I've been given mercy and peace, abundanza. I have been given love that I didn't deserve and didn't need or know that I needed, abundanza. We have all been blessed abundantly. Jesus said in John's gospel, the thief comes to kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it. What? Abundanza. Live that way. You will be a sign that points someone to their Savior. Amen and abundanza. Amen.